Thank you for joining me for more Southwest stories. I hope you enjoy these while you relax or drive. This group of stories will cover famous massacres of the Southwest. Please leave a like or comment. For further desert adventures, hit the subscribe button. Welcome to today's episode of Southwest Desert, where we delve into the untold stories of America's Southwest history. Today, we're taking you back to the rugged terrain of New Mexico in the year 1860, to a place where the echoes of a long-forgotten massacre still resonate through the pines of the Chuska Mountains. Our story begins with a tantalizing claim that there is only one man who knew the true account of the bloody event that unfolded in those mountains over 160 years ago. His name is Naltsos Nalyai, the son of the Navajo chief who led his warriors against Mexican slave raiders in a dramatic encounter that would come to be known as the Mountain Massacre. He told this story in the 1930s. Please forgive any mispronunciations in the following story. As we begin our journey into this tale, it's important to note that the events we're about to describe come directly from Naltsos Nalyai's own words, as told to Richard Van Valkenburg. This first-hand account gives us a rare glimpse into a pivotal moment in Navajo history, one that has been passed down through generations. Let's set the scene. It's 1860 and tensions between the Navajo people and Mexican settlers are at a boiling point. For decades, Mexican slave raids have been a constant threat to Navajo communities, with women and children being kidnapped and sold into slavery. The Navajo, understandably, are hungry for revenge. Our story begins in the season the Navajo call Reeds Flowered. Word spreads through the Navajo camps like wildfire. A large group of armed Mexicans is making its way westward, guided by enemy Navajo from Sandoval's band at Cebuleta. The news sends a ripple of activity through the camps. Nataliath, the war singer, begins to prepare his medicine, a crucial part of the spiritual preparation for battle. Meanwhile, the Navajo warriors start patching their thick buckskin shirts and sharpening their lances. As they work, they boast about how they'll deal with the Mexican coyotes, their voices filled with a mixture of bravado and anticipation. This eagerness for battle isn't just about the immediate threat. It's deeply rooted in the collective memory of the Navajo people. Naltsos Nalyai tells us that the old-time Navajo were always hungry for blood revenge, their minds never far from the massacre of their kinsmen in the cave in the Canon del Muerto. This reference to a past atrocity gives us a glimpse into the cycle of violence that had shaped relations between the Navajo and Mexican settlers. As the Mexican party advances, Navajo scouts keep a watchful eye on their progress. They report that the Mexicans are following the Great Navajo Trail, a route that today is partially covered by a railroad. The invaders pass through Cubero, navigate the treacherous lava beds, and make their way up the valley of La Agua Azul. Near Fort Wingate, they turn north, passing through an area known as La Mesa de los Coyotes. When the Mexican party makes camp at a spring in the foothills near Nascbiti, or the place of the badger, their intentions become clear to the Navajo. It's evident that they're planning to raid the Navajo summer camps near Todilquil Bejequid. In response, the Navajo elders quickly mobilize, sending women and children along with their precious sheep to hide in the deep canyons of the Tsegui to the west. Guided by their Navajo enemies, the Mexican party finds the horse trail leading to the top of the mountain. As night falls, their campfires encircle the shores of Bay Equid Beneji, the Long Lake, which the Mexicans refer to as La Laguna Grande. It's a scene of deceptive tranquility, 
For in the black shadows just beyond the glow of the campfires, Naltsos Nalyai's father and his warriors are preparing for battle, fletching their war bows in anticipation of the coming conflict. Before dawn breaks, the Mexican party breaks camp. Like wolves seeking to surprise their prey, they move out early, but little do they know, they're walking into a carefully laid trap. Hidden in the dense forest, Navajo warriors skirt their flanks and rear, positioning themselves for the ambush to come. As the red sun of Jobatiabai rises from behind the blue ridge of the mountains, the Mexican party rides directly into the Navajo trap. The location is perfect, a valley pinched in by two oak-covered spurs, leaving the Mexicans with little room to maneuver. The silence of the early morning is broken by a signal from Naltsos Nalyai's father to Nataliath, the war singer. The Bathli, or war leader, gives the signal, the gobble of Taji, the wild turkey. It's a sound that would have been familiar to all present, but in this context, it carries a chilling new meaning. In an instant, the peaceful mountain scene erupts into chaos. From three directions, the singing war arrows of the dime, as the Navajo call themselves, pour into the Mexican ranks. The air is filled with the whoops of Navajo warriors as they crash through the thickets, their lances lowered for the charge. Caught by surprise, the Mexicans react in panic. They beat their plunging horses, trying to escape the deadly trap. But as Naltsos Nalyai describes it, they're being herded like Jadi, the antelope, into a hunting corral with no outlet. He compares them to Mei, their coyote brothers, running to find a hole to sneak into. Just before reaching Total Kiel Behekid, the Mexican party makes a desperate move. They swerve off the trail and take refuge on a rocky hill. Working quickly, they construct a makeshift fort using logs and stones. It's a defensive position, but one that will soon prove futile. The Navajo warriors, covered by trees and rocks, creep close to the Mexican position. In a display of psychological warfare, they begin to taunt their enemies. Naksai Ida, oh ho, old Mexicans, they call out. You'll all be dead. Pretty soon the girls over at Kubero will be crying. It's a chilling prophecy of what's to come. The battle rages on throughout the afternoon. Navajo arrows bring down the Mexican horses, their screams echoing through the mountain valley. Seven Navajo warriors fall in the fighting, their deaths only serving to fuel the desire for revenge among their kinsmen. As the sun begins to set, its light described poetically by Naltsos Nalyai as blood-speckled, his father initiates a clever tactic to break the Mexican defenses. Along with a warrior known as Hashke Nezi, or the Long Warrior, he sneaks behind a smooth log lying on the slope below the Mexican position. They create a diversion, yelling and making noise to draw the Mexicans' attention. As the Mexicans focus on the commotion below, firing their muskets at the log, something else is happening. Like the mountain lion, the Navajo warriors creep in from the sides. The forest is eerily quiet, with only the summer song of the gentle breeze people playing on the mountaintop. Suddenly, the stillness is shattered by the staccato gobble of Taji, the wild turkey, the signal to attack. Naltsos Nalyai's father and Hashke Nezi charge the Mexican position, running in a zigzag pattern to avoid the musket balls whistling around them. At the same moment, the hidden Navajo warriors strike from the sides, described vividly as a stroke of male lightning. The final assault is swift and brutal. Navajo warriors swarm over the cornered Mexicans, their lances and knives flashing in the fading light. The majority of the Mexicans are killed behind their hastily constructed breastworks. A few manage to break away, fleeing through the forest like rabbits, but they're quickly run down by mounted Navajo warriors. The battle ends as quickly as it began. Before the blue smoke of gunpowder has a chance to drift up through the pines, the ground is covered with the bodies of the fallen Mexicans. 
In a grim postscript to the battle, a wounded man is discovered under the pile of bodies. He's recognized as Jose, an enemy Navajo who had guided the Mexican party. His fate is sealed on the spot, killed for his perceived treachery. With the battle over, the Navajo turn to the task of honoring their fallen. They lay their dead kinsmen in crevices and cover them with rocks, a simple but respectful burial in the harsh mountain terrain. The aftermath of the battle extends beyond the immediate cleanup. Naltzos Nalyai tells us that the tribe later held a swaying dance, a purification ritual for the warriors who had taken scalps in the battle. Medicine men ascended the mountain to collect enemy bones, which were wrapped in ceremonial bundles. This practice, we're told, continues to this day with Navajo Hathli, or medicine men, returning to the site to collect bones for the Ana Jihi, or enemy way ceremony, which the white men call the squaw dance. As Naltzos Nalyai concludes his account, he brings us back to the time when he shared this story with Richard Van Valkenburg. He describes revisiting the site of the battle with his father just two years before the old chief's death in 1892. It's a poignant detail that underscores the personal connection Naltzos Nalyai has to this history. Van Valkenburg explores the battle site with Naltzos Nalyai. They climb to the top of the knoll where the final stand took place. The scene that greets them is a stark reminder of the violence that occurred there decades earlier. The breastworks built by the Mexicans have crumbled, now just lichen-covered stones and rotted logs scattered across the Malpay Rim. Under the trees lie the scattered skeletons of many horses, grim testament to the animals that fell in the battle. Mixed among these larger bones, Van Valkenburg notices smaller ones, human vertebrae. It's a chilling discovery that brings home the reality of the massacre. It's a sobering sight, one that Van Valkenburg describes with a mixture of queasiness and a notable lack of pity. As they leave the mountain valley, Van Valkenburg reflects on the broader historical context of the massacre. He notes that the Navajo's actions, brutal as they were, came in response to decades of provocation. He specifically mentions the massacre of some 100 Navajo women and children in Canon del Muerto in 1805, an atrocity that marked the beginning of a cycle of violence and retribution. The Mexican slave hunts, Van Valkenburg concludes, could only result in reprisals from the Navajo. It's a stark reminder of the complex and often brutal nature of frontier conflicts, where grievances and acts of violence perpetuated a seemingly endless cycle of revenge. The account of Naltzos Nalyai, passed down through generations and preserved by Richard von Valkenburg, offers us a rare Navajo perspective on these events. It's a narrative that doesn't shy away from the brutality of the conflict, but also provides context for the Navajo actions, rooting them in a history of exploitation and violence at the hands of Mexican slave raiders. This story also highlights the importance of oral history in preserving the perspectives and experiences of indigenous peoples. Without Naltzos Nalyai's account, this event might have been lost to time or only remembered through the potentially biased accounts of non-native sources. As we've seen, the repercussions of the mountain massacre extended far beyond the immediate aftermath of the battle. The site became a place of spiritual significance for the Navajo, tied to important purification rituals and ceremonies. This underscores the deep connection between historical events, landscape, and spiritual practices in Navajo culture. As we end our journey into this dark chapter of New Mexico's past, we're left with a vivid picture of a moment frozen in time, the bones of the fallen still lying beneath the pines of the Chuska Mountains, a silent testament to the brutal realities of frontier life. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Southwest Desert. We hope this exploration of the mountain massacre has provided you with a new perspective on this little-known event in American history. Until next time, Keep listening for the echoes of the past.
August of 1680, a meticulously planned revolt erupted across the deserts, mesas, and Sangre de Cristo Mountains of northern New Mexico. An unlikely alliance formed between 20,000 Native Americans, Pecos, Zuni, Hopi, and Acoma, from 60 pueblos scattered across 70,000 square miles, who had four distinct languages and several dialects. They united to drive out the Spanish colonists who had controlled the region for nearly a century. They launched one of the most successful uprisings against European settlers in all of North America during the colonial era. Over the next 12 days, this event, now known as the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, showed the unbelievable resolve of an oppressed people pushed to the brink. Fueled by spiritual convictions and a refusal to abandon ancestral traditions, the outnumbered Pueblo fighters evicted settlers, monks, and governors alike from their homeland. They dealt both a symbolic and strategic blow against the expansionist Spanish Empire. Our story begins in the Kivas of Taos Pueblo in 1675, where a medicine man named Pope plotted rebellion after being imprisoned by Spanish authorities for idolatry and evil doing. Using clever tricks like covering his body with flaming phosphorus, Pope convinced the Pueblos that their gods sanctioned an uprising to overthrow their Spanish overlords. The Pueblos had many grievances under Spanish rule. They were forced to provide tribute labor and products. Their religious practices were banned, and they blamed droughts and disease on the failure of Spanish religion. Pope united a network of far-flung Pueblos, sending knotted cords to signify the revolt date. However, when some plotters wavered and Spanish officials captured runners, Pope showed his ruthlessness by killing his own son-in-law for suspected betrayal. Because of this, he moved up the revolt date. On August 10, 1680, a horrific, coordinated massacre began across New Mexico as pueblos rose up resulting in over 400 Spanish deaths. Friars were martyred in hideous ways, with one padre scourged through a village naked and tied astride a pig until he perished. Spanish settlers fled to Santa Fe. After destroying the remote areas, Pueblo warriors surrounded the capital, using a clever ruse to cut off Santa Fe's water. After two days without water and failed negotiations, the beleaguered Spanish retreated south towards Mexico in what an Indian victory song called the Death of the Spanish Gods. With the Spanish gone, Pope banned his followers from speaking Spanish or uttering Christian names, scrubbing themselves in rivers to remove traces of baptism. After destroying all Catholic symbolism, traditional dances and kivas were revived and old idols restored. But Pope soon exploited his heroic status. Clad in finery, he traveled through pueblos, extracting obedience and tribute like a dictator, falling into civil war-inducing decadence before dying in disgrace. Though Spain retook New Mexico in 1692 after years of conflict, the revolt dealt them a lasting blow. It enabled pueblos to preserve more of their old religion, with Spanish authorities adopting increased tolerance after reconquest. So as we marvel at enduring Pueblo dances today, we have crafty manipulator and flawed liberator Pope to thank for this cultural legacy. The Pueblo revolt deserves more prominence as a transformational event in early Southwestern history. For over 12 years, it completely overturned colonial rule in New Mexico. Its complex legacy continues to shape Pueblo cultural persistence today. It provides potent lessons on the power of united action in the face of injustice and how people can successfully defend human rights and sacred lifeways against imperial oppression. Thank you for joining me on this journey through Southwest history. Welcome to the fascinating history of the Yuma Ferry, Fort Yuma, and the Yuma Massacre. Today, 
We'll explore the events that led to the establishment of this important military outpost on the Colorado River and the dramatic incidents that shaped its early years. Our story begins in February 1850, when John Glanton and his band of scalp-hunting renegades arrived at the Yuma crossing of the Colorado River. They immediately saw an opportunity in the ferry operation run by Dr. A.L. Lincoln. Glanton, a blackleg lawyer from Tennessee with a ruthless reputation, announced himself as a new partner who would ensure the ferry was managed properly. Glanton and his gang had a dark history. They had previously been hired by the state of Chihuahua in Mexico to collect Apache scalps, with prices ranging from $25 for children to $100 for men. However, their greed led them to start scalping Mexican citizens as well. When this was discovered, they fled to California, where they saw the ferry as their next source of easy money. Under Glanton's control, the ferry rates became exorbitant. The gang used gangster tactics to collect fares and ruthlessly eliminated any competition. This created a situation that would eventually require government intervention and lead to the establishment of Fort Yuma. Tension between the ferry operators and the local Yuma Native Americans came to a head on April 23, 1850. That morning, three white men from Glanton's band, William Carr, Marcus L. Webster, and Joseph A. Anderson, were suddenly attacked while cutting willow poles. They fled through the thickets, dodging arrows as they raced towards the ferry buildings. In a dramatic escape, the three men managed to reach a small boat and push off into the river. Little did they know, they were now the sole survivors of the Lincoln Glanton Ferry Company. Back at the ferry, Dr. Lincoln was asleep while Glanton and his men were in a drunken stupor. Led by Chief Caballo Sinpelo, the Yuma warriors attacked. Glanton was killed with a rock while Lincoln and the others were clubbed to death. The Native Americans even tied the company's dogs to the bodies of Lincoln and Glanton, burning them alive with the bodies in the ferry houses. This massacre was the culmination of growing tensions between the ferry operators and the Yuma tribe. The trouble had begun when a General Anderson from Tennessee refused to pay Glanton's high toll and instead built his own boat downstream. He then turned this ferry over to the Yumas with the agreement that they would charge fair rates. Glanton, unwilling to tolerate competition, had the Yumas hired ferrymen killed and destroyed their ferry. When Chief Caballo Sinpelo attempted to negotiate a compromise, Glanton made the fatal mistake of beating him and kicking him out. This insult to the Yuma leader sealed the fate of the white ferryman on the Colorado. The three survivors, Carr, Webster, and Anderson, managed to escape downriver and eventually made their way to San Diego. On May 9, 1850, William Carr gave his account of the massacre to Alcalde Abel Stearns in Los Angeles. However, he didn't reveal all the details about the ferry company's mistreatment of the Yumas. The news of the massacre set wheels in motion. Governor Peter Burnett of California ordered the sheriffs of Los Angeles and San Diego counties to raise posses to establish law and order at the Colorado Crossing. A volunteer militia of 100 men was organized under Major General J.H. Bean and General Joseph C. Moorhead. This expedition, however, was plagued with problems from the start. The organizers struggled to acquire mounts from local rancheros, who were skeptical of the state scrip offered as payment. When Moorhead finally reached the Colorado, he found the Native Americans quiet and going about their business. This didn't sit well with some of the more aggressive militiamen, mostly emigrants from Arkansas and Missouri. Tensions escalated when a militiaman shot a Native American. Moorhead's attempt at diplomacy backfired when he told the Yuma leaders that the white men had come to treat or fight. The Yuma war chief Pasqual responded that while he wouldn't treat, he was willing to fight if that's what the white men wanted. Shortly after, 150 Native Americans armed with bows and arrows attacked the volunteer camp. 
20 Native Americans were killed in the ensuing battle. Moorhead's force retreated to the stockade built by the ferry company, effectively ending what became known as the Moorhead War. This ill-fated expedition cost the state of California a total of $76,588.26, a significant sum at the time. The failure of the volunteer militia led to a more organized military response. In July 1850, Major Samuel P. Heinzleman, stationed in San Diego with a regular army unit, received orders to establish a permanent post at the junction of the Gila and Colorado Rivers. However, it wasn't until November 27, 1850, that Heinzelman and his force of U.S. regulars established their post at the mouth of the Gila. The initial site of the camp was about six miles below the present Fort Yuma Indian School. In March 1851, the command moved to higher ground, to the very spot where the ill-fated Mission de la Concepcion had once stood. This site had a tragic history of its own. It was where Padre Francisco Garces had died on July 19, 1781, during the Yuma Revolt. As the soldiers under Major Heinzelman and Lieutenant Thomas W. Sweeney laid out the future Fort Yuma, they cleared away the crumbling adobe and charcoal debris from the destroyed mission. The Commandant's headquarters was built on part of the old stone foundations of the mission. However, the new fort soon faced its own challenges. Provisions ran low and expected supply trains failed to arrive. In June 1851, Heinzleman was forced to fall back toward San Diego, leaving Lieutenant Sweeney with just 10 men to hold the post. Sweeney, a fighting Irishman who had lost an arm in the Mexican War, managed to keep the Native Americans at bay by threatening to use his 12-pound field piece. But as provisions dwindled further, even Sweeney was eventually forced to abandon the post. Before leaving, he cached surplus government property, which the Native Americans promptly dug up and appropriated as soon as the soldiers were out of sight. The main difficulty in maintaining the post was the challenge of supplying it. To address this, a depot of supplies was established at Vallecito, and arrangements were made to send provisions by steamer to the mouth of the Colorado, and then upstream by riverboats. On February 29, 1852, Heinzleman and Sweeney returned to reoccupy the fort. This time, it was to be a permanent post. The soldiers were dismayed to find that the Native Americans had burned their previous willow pole and mud quarters, meaning they had to start construction all over again. In March, Heinzleman decided to end all Native hostilities in the vicinity of Fort Yuma. He sent out three detachments to scour the country between the two rivers and to the north of the post. However, these operations were hampered by supply issues. When a steamer carrying badly needed supplies failed to arrive, Heinzleman sent Major Fitzgerald with 24 men downstream to investigate. This detachment was ambushed 22 miles below Yuma, resulting in seven casualties. Despite these setbacks, by October 11, 1852, Major Heinzleman was able to issue an order announcing the termination of hostilities with the river tribesmen. He declared, The recent expedition has resulted in their entire subjection to the United States authority. To continue this good understanding, the Native Americans must be treated with justice and kindness. Although major Native American troubles had ceased, the garrison at Fort Yuma faced other challenges. On October 26, 1852, a fire broke out in the fort, destroying several buildings including the commissary storehouse. The blaze threatened to ignite barrels of cannon powder and boxes of ammunition. In a dramatic moment, Major Heinzleman and Lieutenant Sweeney rushed into the burning building to save the explosives, with only a few brave soldiers following them. As if the fire weren't enough, the post was rocked by a severe earthquake on November 29th. The tremors were so bad that sentries abandoned their post to huddle on the parade ground. Gigantic cracks opened in the ground, 
and the river behaved erratically. Relief came on December 3rd when the steamer Uncle Sam arrived with about 20 tons of commissary stores. This was the first steamer to navigate the river all the way to Fort Yuma, marking a significant improvement in the fort's supply situation. After the fire, efforts began to build a more substantial Fort Yuma. Adobe buildings were started, but progress was slow. It wasn't until late in 1854 that a large construction force arrived from San Diego to build the post under the supervision of D.B. Kurtz. By June 1855, work was well underway, continuing at a brisk rate despite the notorious Yuma heat. The heat at Fort Yuma was legendary, giving rise to several tall tales. One story claimed that a dog once ran across the parade ground on three legs, yelping at every jump because the ground was so hot. Another tale suggested that hens at Yuma laid hard-boiled eggs. Perhaps the most outrageous story was about an old soldier who died at Fort Yuma and went to hell, only to return the next night to get his blankets because hell was cooler. Despite these exaggerations, the heat was indeed extreme. On June 16, 1859, the thermometer registered 119 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest temperature recorded in nine years. By the outbreak of the Civil War, Fort Yuma had become a substantial post. It no longer relied on hauling water by cart from the river. The buildings were made of adobe, plastered inside and out. There were about 23 structures surrounding the flat, barren parade ground. In October and November 1861, redoubts, semicircular outposts with earthen embankments, were constructed to improve the fort's defenses. As the Native American threat diminished and the surrounding area became more settled, Fort Yuma's military importance began to wane. On July 17, 1884, the acting Secretary of War advised President Chester A. Arthur that Fort Yuma was no longer necessary as a military reservation. On July 22, 1884, the President transferred Fort Yuma to the Department of the Interior, and on July 28, an official order informed the Army that the post had ceased to exist. Fort Yuma's story didn't end there, however. On March 5, 1892, it became part of the Yuma Native American Reservation, bringing its history full circle. The fort, originally established in response to conflicts with the Yuma tribe, was now part of their protected lands. The story of Fort Yuma is a microcosm of the broader narrative of the American West. It encompasses themes of frontier justice, conflict between settlers and Native Americans, the challenges of establishing civilization in harsh environments, and the eventual pacification and settlement of the region. The fort's history reminds us of the complex and often violent processes that shape the American frontier. It stands as a testament to the resilience of both the soldiers who manned its walls and the Native Americans who called the surrounding lands home. Today, the site of Fort Yuma continues to overlook the Colorado River, a silent witness to the turbulent events that once unfolded along its banks. Thank you for joining us on this historical journey. In 1851, a brave yet foolhardy family of emigrants from Illinois set out on a fateful wagon journey that would end in unimaginable tragedy and launch one of the most gripping survival sagas of America's western expansion. The Oatman clan numbered nine souls. The Oatman parents, their seven children aged 15 years to infancy, plus a babe in arms. Propelled by rumors of abundant land and gold in California, Royce Oatman turned a deaf ear to the many dire warnings about traveling through Arizona's desert wasteland. He scoffed at tales of frequent deadly attacks by Apaches and other tribes who viewed emigrants as trespassing invaders. So in the spring of 1851, 
Oatman pointed his wagon train westward into the Arizona Territory, just one tiny caravan crawling over endless miles of arid nothingness toward an uncertain future in California. It was on the afternoon of March 18, 1851, on the way to Fort Yuma from Pimale. The attack occurred near the Gila River in what was then the territory of New Mexico, later Arizona territory that fate at last intervened. Roy spotted a band of Apaches heading straight toward them. Before he could react or arm himself, deafening war cries filled the air as the Indians attacked without warning. Young Lorenzo was clubbed violently and collapsed unconscious into the dirt. His father managed a single errant rifle shot before being swarmed and butchered on the spot. Screaming Mother Mary Ann clutched baby Charles amid the onslaught. The Apaches pillaged all valuables from the wagon before setting it aflame. Then they rounded up Olive and Mary Ann as slaves. The raiders presumed they'd successfully killed all other family members. By the grace of God or simple luck, young Lorenzo Oatman was not dead. Hours later, when the moon rose, Lorenzo awoke disoriented in the dirt, squinting through swollen eyes at the gory scene surrounding him. Memories of the attack flooded his mind. Lorenzo spotted the charred skeleton of their wagon atop a 20-foot bluff and staggered up the embankment. Among scattered corpses, he identified the bodies of his beloved parents and siblings, all except absent Olive and Mary Ann. Half crazed with pain, fearing the attacker's return, Lorenzo fled blindly into the moonlit wasteland. He wandered in futile search of his sisters for some time before discovering the Gila River. Exhausted, he slept fitfully on its muddy shores. After days alone resigned to die in the desert, Lorenzo was shocked by two Native Americans riding directly toward him. These men were Pima hunters who meant Lorenzo no harm. Their people maintained generally peaceful relations with white settlers. Too weak to walk, the hunters conveyed the gravely dehydrated, delirious Lorenzo back to the village of Pimole. When he regained strength after days recuperating in Pimole, Lorenzo learned that his two sisters' fates remained a mystery. The Pimas told of rumors that Apaches held two light-skinned girl captives, but such whispers held more hope than certainty. Nonetheless, Lorenzo became obsessed with rescuing Olive and Mary Ann from the raiders who'd massacred their family. Penniless, orphaned, but sustained by a brother's enduring love, Young Lorenzo pleaded in vain for the Pimole villagers to send out armed search parties. With settlers few and scattered across Arizona's frontier, such missions were deemed suicidal amid the ever-present Apache threat. The villagers promised only their prayers and some basic supplies for Lorenzo's travels. His body still healing, Lorenzo set out for Fort Yuma on foot to complete the journey his parents died attempting. Now destitute, he hoped to enlist military aid from the fort to locate and retrieve his captive sisters. At Fort Yuma, the officers heard Lorenzo's story politely enough, but soon dashed his hopes with painful candor. Based on ample past experience with Apache tactics, his sisters would have been brutally raped and murdered their first night, if kept alive that long. The soldiers insisted stale rumors of two surviving white girl captives made no tactical sense and were surely just Indian lies. What use could young girls serve the Apaches, the commander asked. With no skills and unable to bear Apache children, logic meant Olive and Mary Ann must be dead. Lorenzo refused to accept the army's cold reasoning. But they weren't killed with the others, he insisted. His sisters were out there somewhere, waiting and praying for rescue. Lorenzo swore he'd devote all energy and resources at his disposal to the search, though admittedly meager. Yet Fort Yuma's military community remained unmoved by Lorenzo's stirring testament. They offered provisions to speed him on his journey to California, but refused to dispatch soldiers on what officers deemed a fool's errand into the Badlands. 
Lorenzo did spark sympathy and outrage from miners, frontiersmen and settlers who came through Yuma and heard his tragic tale. In campfire circles crackling with curiosity, Lorenzo repeated his saga night after night. At one such gathering about four weeks later, the tale galvanized a gang of nine hardened miners into action. That night, the men voted unanimously to mount a volunteer rescue posse to seek the Oatman girls, raid the Apaches, and punish them for their butchery. Come sunrise, though, Fort Yuma's commander declared no such vigilante party could be sanctioned on a mission he continued insisting was almost certainly futile. The miners reluctantly disbanded. A warm-hearted doctor named Hewitt befriended young Lorenzo for a while, but urgent family matters soon forced the doctor to depart alone east. Yet again, abandoned but unbroken, our brave young protagonist took to the frontier trails in pursuit of his kidnapped sisters. By late 1853, over two years had passed since his family's massacre. Lorenzo realized his best chances of mounting a rescue lay in a big city where wealthy men with resources might take up his cause. So he set his sights on San Francisco, sprawling boomtown gateway for adventurers from across the globe flocking to California's gold rush. But the bright lights and big city soon proved all glitter and no gold for young Oatman. Securing employment was no trouble for the strapping farm lad, but the non-stop hustle for cash left San Francisco's masses no time for sympathy. Lorenzo's tragic tale elicited only chuckles and drinks one night from a crowd of off-duty miners. Crushed, feeling a stranger in a strange land, Lorenzo wrote San Francisco off as a dead end. He drifted south digging for gold himself. By October 1854, Lorenzo had journeyed southwest to Los Angeles, where whisperings hinted Apache raiders held light-skinned captives. Here at last, he encountered signs his efforts were having impact. Over years, his tragic story had spread gradually across the frontier, even reaching East Coast newspapers. The 18-year-old Lorenzo now cut an imposing figure, thick-necked and broad-shouldered. His tale commanded attention, evoking community outrage. Yet confirming Olive and Mary Ann's fates remained maddeningly elusive. Some travelers reported Apaches claimed no white captives at all, while others repeated the stale rumor that one surviving girl remained hostage somewhere north. With confusion and distance from the kidnapping now spanning three years, Lorenzo's various sources grew increasingly suspect. Meanwhile, in Arizona's wild borderlands, the Oatman saga evolved over years of retelling into fireside legend. Whichever version one believed, all shared conviction the lost girls must certainly be dead after years among the Apaches. Lorenzo Oatman simply refused to quit. Our tireless hero crisscrossed the Southwest multiple times, trekking desert paths alone for hundreds of miles seeking tribal villages, constantly inquiring about his sisters. He joined surveying groups when opportunity arose. Lorenzo drifted into the patterns of a haunted drifter, taking dangerous jobs, trading seasonal labor for bunk and board wherever he paused his ongoing quest. At remote campsites, Lorenzo repeatedly told his tale, hoping to gather useful clues. But the next day always found the stranger saddling up solitary again upon another empty trail. By 1856, five years after the massacre, the 20-year-old Lorenzo arrived in Yuma, depressed and world-weary. But fortune finally delivered a slender ray of light. An old letter given to Lorenzo contained recent second-hand report from a bush trader named Rowlett, who claimed to have personally met and spoken with Olive. Rowlett vouched a teenage Olive was indeed alive just months earlier, somehow still surviving amid northern Arizona's Mojave tribe after they had traded her from the Apaches. This electrifying update vaulted new energy into Lorenzo's wilting hopes of finally bringing his sweet sister Olive home. He hastily retraced his route northward toward the forlorn heart of Apache country, 
pushing himself to utter exhaustion. Lorenzo aimed to intercept friendly tribal leaders, hoping they could serve as intermediaries with the notoriously hostile Mojaves and their Apache cousins. The most direct route led straight through the domain of those volatile hostiles Lorenzo desperately hoped to avoid confrontation with. Yet he forged ahead heedless of danger, propelled by newfound faith that beloved Olive still drew breath somewhere ahead. If he could just slip into her captor's camp at night, his stealth and sheer nerve might suffice to sneak Olive to freedom. But Lorenzo's brazen rescue scheme was not meant to be. Barely one week into Mojave country, he was spotted and pursued by three Native American sentries. A brief exchange of gunfire before Oatman fled on foot into rocky terrain. He scrambled without stopping for hours, up crumbly arroyos and through spiny brush. Finally, after nightfall, Lorenzo stumbled upon the flooded Colorado River. With no chance of escape on open ground, Lorenzo plunged desperately into the powerful currents, clinging to a thick tree branch to avoid being swept under or dashed on rocks. Days later, Lorenzo returned to Yuma feverish and defeated. Though grateful to be alive, despair now fully smothered all hope of rescuing beloved Olive. His daring solo raid had failed utterly. Without money for paying ransom fees or enlisting experienced Indian fighters, realistic chances for success dwindled to nothing. Our crestfallen hero now faced the grim certainty that Olive must remain captive forever or had likely long since gone to her reward. Perhaps it was time at last for this lone Oatman survivor to lay the past to rest. Thus mired in black sorrow, Lorenzo wandered brokenly west through Arizona and California and ended up in the town of Monte. Prospects seemed empty for fulfilling relationships or purposeful life of his own. Then, in the sleepy desert town of Yuma, where his crusade began five years earlier, sensational news exploded one February 1856 morning to jolt Lorenzo out of his gloomy abyss. A friend galloped up, waving a Los Angeles newspaper and pointing excitedly to banner headlines reading, an American woman rescued from the Indians. In terse words, the report confirmed beyond wildest dreams that his sister Olive was alive after four years of captivity and back safe at Fort Yuma. Lorenzo collapsed, shuddering into the dirt, overcome with release of grief long buried. Lorenzo regained enough composure to travel urgently west the 200 miles to reunite with dear Olive. The dramatic cannon booms and ringing hoorays that accompanied her rescue delivery were described as deafening. Olive arrived escorted by a Yuma Native American named Francisco, seeking promised payment for the lost woman. Her clothing tattered and skin leathery with crude tattoos from mutilating tribal rituals, the fully grown Olive was zombie-like amid the chaotic celebration. Quivering from trauma and malnutrition, her haunted eyes scanned the cheering mob without comprehending. It was a kindly stranger named Grinnell who first greeted Lorenzo days later upon his arrival, providing long-awaited account of Olive's providential rescue. Four years after the massacre, Grinnell confirmed young Mary Ann had perished. But rumors persisted of the surviving Olive, somehow enduring abuse from the Mojaves after being traded from the Apaches. So Grinnell tirelessly negotiated with all local tribes, personally offering reward for Olive's return, not in dollars but practical barter of livestock, food, and blankets. And one day his righteousness paid dividends. Francisco arrived at Fort Yuma after an extraordinary 400-mile round-trip journey on foot into dangerous Mojave land. He had ventured alone to face Olive's skeptical captors with his promised bounty, out-bargaining the Mojaves to let the woman return home with him. As for details of the highly emotional reunion between Olive and her devoted brother Lorenzo, the earnest witnesses present described it as almost mystical in poignancy. Upon seeing Lorenzo, Olive rushed forth, but the shock of reconciliation was too intense for words. 
For long moments the siblings fell trembling into tearful embrace, able only to weep openly as they clung together once more. Lorenzo stroked Olive's hair and tattooed face, assuring his sweet sister her horrific trials were finished. Never again would she spend a night in bondage. In days to follow, Olive haltingly recounted her four years of captivity since the massacre. Some months after the wagon attack, she was indeed traded by Apaches to the Mojaves for some trinkets. But her frail sibling had not survived the brutality of captivity long. Little Mary Ann had previously perished, unable to endure the chronic abuse and starvation. And now at last, she was in Lorenzo's strong arms again. Though her spirit had been crushed long ago and beauty stolen, the Oatman family nightmare had come full circle. First, they lived six months in Oregon off money from the book written about her captivity. She still was not doing well, so Lorenzo hoped to gradually heal Olive by bringing her back east, far from these haunted southwestern lands. Olive's slipping sanity was evident. Episodes of madness tortured her waking hours with violent flashbacks of Indian outrages, episodes that grew worse with time. Emotionally broken long before her unlikely rescue, by 1858 Olive had utterly ceased to function, overcome by traumatic melancholy that would not release its demonic grip. Within two years of walking free once more, Olive Oatman died insane, her tormented soul finally extinguished. The tale of how the Oatmans courageously struggled and their terrible fate out west riveted newspaper readers nationwide following the original massacre. Twice widowed by tragedy, poor Lorenzo laid his only sibling Olive to rest, unable to protect her tormented mind. With the last of his kindred gone, the lone Oatman survivor faded into obscure frontier history, so concluded the extraordinary Oatman Odyssey, which touched the extremes of human cruelty and compassion on the American frontier. Thanks to one good Samaritan's perseverance and a heroic Yuma tribesman, Lorenzo's hope was briefly revived when Olive improbably returned from five years' captivity. But her second tragic death was no less devastating. Yet the story remains intact of how, Against all odds, a lost daughter of Arizona endured half a decade of slavery and surfaced sane enough to walk again on free soil into her brother's arms. Thank you for joining me on this Southwest journey. August of 1680, a meticulously planned revolt erupted across the deserts, mesas, and Sangre de Cristo Mountains of northern New Mexico. An unlikely alliance formed between 20,000 Native Americans, Pecos, Zuni, Hopi, and Acoma, from 60 pueblos scattered across 70,000 square miles, who had four distinct languages and several dialects. They united to drive out the Spanish colonists who had controlled the region for nearly a century. They launched one of the most successful uprisings against European settlers in all of North America during the colonial era. Over the next 12 days, this event, now known as the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, showed the unbelievable resolve of an oppressed people pushed to the brink. Fueled by spiritual convictions and a refusal to abandon ancestral traditions, the outnumbered Pueblo fighters evicted settlers, monks, and governors alike from their homeland. They dealt both a symbolic and strategic blow against the expansionist Spanish Empire. Our story begins in the Kivas of Taos Pueblo in 1675, where a medicine man named Pope plotted rebellion after being imprisoned by Spanish authorities for idolatry and evil doing. Using clever tricks like covering his body with flaming phosphorus, Pope convinced the Pueblos that their gods sanctioned an uprising to overthrow their Spanish overlords. The Pueblos had many grievances under Spanish rule. They were forced to provide tribute labor and products. Their religious practices were banned 
and they blamed droughts and disease on the failure of Spanish religion. Pope united a network of far-flung pueblos, sending knotted cords to signify the revolt date. However, when some plotters wavered and Spanish officials captured runners, Pope showed his ruthlessness by killing his own son-in-law for suspected betrayal. Because of this, he moved up the revolt date. On August 10, 1680, a horrific, coordinated massacre began across New Mexico as pueblos rose up, resulting in over 400 Spanish deaths. Friars were martyred in hideous ways, with one padre scourged through a village naked and tied astride a pig until he perished. Spanish settlers fled to Santa Fe. After destroying the remote areas, Pueblo warriors surrounded the capital, using a clever ruse to cut off Santa Fe's water. After two days without water and failed negotiations, the beleaguered Spanish retreated south towards Mexico in what an Indian victory song called the Death of the Spanish Gods. With the Spanish gone, Pope banned his followers from speaking Spanish or uttering Christian names, scrubbing themselves in rivers to remove traces of baptism. After destroying all Catholic symbolism, traditional dances and kivas were revived and old idols restored. But Pope soon exploited his heroic status. Clad in finery, he traveled through pueblos, extracting obedience and tribute like a dictator, falling into civil war-inducing decadence before dying in disgrace. Though Spain retook New Mexico in 1692 after years of conflict, the revolt dealt them a lasting blow. It enabled pueblos to preserve more of their old religion, with Spanish authorities adopting increased tolerance after reconquest. So as we marvel at enduring Pueblo dances today, we have crafty manipulator and flawed liberator Pope to thank for this cultural legacy. The Pueblo revolt deserves more prominence as a transformational event in early Southwestern history. For over 12 years, it completely overturned colonial rule in New Mexico. Its complex legacy continues to shape Pueblo cultural persistence today. It provides potent lessons on the power of united action in the face of injustice and how people can successfully defend human rights and sacred lifeways against imperial oppression. Thank you for joining me on this journey through Southwest history. Welcome to another Southwest Desert episode, where we will recount the tragic events of the Bisbee Massacre, one of the bloodiest incidents in early Arizona history. Our story begins on a fateful evening in December 1883 in the mining town of Bisbee, Arizona. It was soon after dark on Saturday, December 8, 1883, when two men, one masked and one unmasked, entered the general store of A. Castaneda and Joe Goldwater in Bisbee. The unmasked man pointed his gun at the store's bookkeeper, Peter Dahl, demanding he raise his hands. Dal hesitated at first, prompting the second masked bandit to also aim his revolver at the clerk. Three more masked men then entered the store, covering the customers and other employees. With multiple weapons trained on him, Goldwater quickly opened the safe. Meanwhile, two bandits had returned outside, patrolling the street with rifles. Just as Goldwater swung the safe door open, those inside heard one of the men outside shout, Come on in here, at a passerby. The citizen replied, No, you don't, before two gunshots rang out and the man staggered and fell dead against the Bonton Saloon. The killing of the man, later identified as Johnny Tappanier, marked the beginning of the Bisbee Massacre, a ruthless incident that would claim three more lives before the night was through. This was no longer a common payroll holdup. It had become deadly serious. Realizing capture would mean the noose, the bandits now fired recklessly at anyone who showed themselves on the street. The second victim that night was D.T. Smith. Earlier, Smith had been in the store but left for a nearby restaurant. Upon hearing the gunfire, he rushed outside with his pistol, only to be shot in the head before he could act. 
The third innocent bystander killed was Mrs. W. Roberts, a 33-year-old woman recently arrived from New York. She unknowingly stepped into the street amid the chaos and was fatally shot. James A. Nally became the fourth victim while trying to find cover from the flying bullets. Hit in the chest, Nally made it to Bob Pierce's saloon before collapsing. He succumbed to his wounds the following day. Inside the store, as the slaughter unfolded outside, Joe Goldwater emptied the safe's contents into the thieves' bags under duress. Not satisfied with their take, one bandit went to the back room where the sickly Castanota rested, forcing him to hand over a stash of gold hidden under his pillow. Their crime complete after five or six blood-soaked minutes, the five outlaws raced out of the store, occasionally firing over their shoulders to deter any pursuit as they mounted their waiting horses and galloped out of town. Deputy Sheriff Bill Daniels, who moonlighted running a saloon when not upholding the law, was shooting billiards when the first shots echoed outside. Rushing to investigate, he ran into a breathless man who filled him in on the situation. As Daniels moved to respond, he was pushed back inside by a half-dozen citizens scrambling for cover. Grabbing two guns and enlisting another armed man, the deputy raced out the rear entrance into a gulch behind the buildings. The pair made their way to the post office before emerging onto the chaotic street. By then, the bandits were fleeing on horseback. He unloaded his gun at the retreating outlaws, but the darkness made for inaccurate shooting. Returning to Castanoda and Goldwater store, the deputy was apprised of the robbery by Joe. Daniels hurried to the Copper Queen mine office, where a man named Ben Williams offered horses and guns to provision a posse. Back in town, a boy informed Daniels he had spotted five men on horseback frantically riding towards Hereford. Finding the town in disarray but managing to gather a posse, Daniels headed to Tombstone to alert the sheriff while he and another man rode to Forest Milk Ranch seeking a trail to follow. Daniels was told a party of five men had passed by not long before, a promising lead. Sending for the newly formed posse, they regrouped at the ranch, camping there until sunrise. The early light revealed tracks heading off the main road. As Daniels led the posse, a man named John Heath suddenly arrived, claiming to have found a divergent set of tracks splitting off further back. Though an experienced tracker who hadn't noticed another trail, Daniels nonetheless took Heath's advice to split up and follow both paths. Heath and two others rode towards Tombstone while Daniels continued westward. An hour later, with no further sign of their quarry, suspicion crept into the deputy's mind. Something was amiss, and John Heath warranted closer scrutiny. By now, Heath had a sizable head start, so Daniels could only double back to their original trail. The posse soon encountered another group near Sulphur Springs Valley who reported seeing a lone rider that morning, watching him alter course and ride off upon spotting them. The same account was offered by a man at Soldier's Holes later that evening. With the outlaw estimated to be a half-day's ride ahead, Daniels pressed onward after pausing to rest and water the horses. Their next stop after nightfall was White's Ranch. The rancher shared that he had seen men matching the bandits' descriptions days prior at Buckles, a neighboring ranch. With no sightings of the lone rider that day, Daniels decided to halt for the night, the trail having gone cold. Rising with the sun, Daniels and his men set out for Buckles Ranch, arriving around 10 a.m. Frank Buckle had crucial information for the posse. Four of the five robbers had been there the previous Wednesday, getting their horses shod. What's more, Buckle revealed that two of them had visited before. One was a debonair, mustachioed man with light hair and complexion, a perfect match for Tex Howard, the unmasked leader of the gang. The second, as described, was the spitting image of none other than John Heath. The pieces fell into place for Daniels. Heath and Howard were associates predating the crime. Heath's conveniently found set of tracks served to throw the posse off the scent. John Heath was now a wanted man. 
Sending a rider with a hobbled horse to Tombstone with orders to have Heath apprehended if spotted, Daniels also dispatched word to Ben Williams in Bisbee to be on the lookout. Based on Buckle's account, Daniels concluded that some or all of the murderous quintet had likely fled to Mexico. Leading the posse south, they searched in vain for three days, checking various ranches for any sign of the killer's passage. Empty-handed, the deputy headed back to Bisbee, realizing that even if on the right track, the fugitives would already be across the border. En route, news reached him that Heath had been arrested and jailed in Tombstone. Daniels resolved to hunt down the four remaining bandits. After a brief respite in Bisbee, Daniels rode out once more, fortune favoring him this time. He located Dan Dowd, one of the robbers, holed up in Coralitos, Chihuahua. Brazenly disregarding the international boundary, Daniels seized Dowd and smuggled him back to Arizona, locking him up in Tombstone. The rest of the gang fell in quick succession following Dowd's capture. Bill Delaney, the second masked marauder, was apprehended in Ninas Prietas, Sonora, by Mexican authorities. Dan Kelly, the third member, was recognized mid-shave by an astute barber who alerted law enforcement. Tex Howard and Red Sample, the ringleader and the final member respectively, surfaced in Clifton five days post-robbery, flashing their ill-gotten wealth. A distinctive double-cased gold pocket watch inscribed with the name William Clancy, identified by sharp-eyed bartender Walter Bush as part of the loot extorted from Goldwater, proved their undoing. In short order, the last two fugitives were jailed alongside their partners in crime. The wheels of justice turned swiftly. After a speedy trial, the captured outlaws were sentenced to hang on March 28, 1884. However, the gruesome tally of the dead and condemned sparked by Johnny Tapanier's murder was not yet complete. Focus shifted to John Heath, suspected accomplice to the robbery turned massacre. Trial testimony brought to light Heath's backstory. A Texas native who had arrived in Bisbee mere days before the bloodbath, entering into a saloon venture with a Mr. Waite. It was revealed that Heath and Howard, both Texans, had been partners for three years, drifting apart before reuniting in Clifton, Arizona. During the Clifton to Bisbee journey, their party grew to six, joined by Bill Delaney, Dan Kelly, Red Sample, and Big Ben Dowd. The original aim split the group. Ben, Red, and York planned to push on to Mexico while Heath intended to settle in Bisbee and go straight with a legitimate enterprise. Ultimately, ringleader Howard roped them all into his illicit scheme. Heath's level of complicity being argued, the court found him guilty as an accessory, sentencing him to 20 years in Yuma Territorial Prison, likely to his relief. But the citizens of Bisbee, robbed of four of their own that fateful December night, would not be placated by anything less than a life for a life. In the pre-dawn hours of February 22, 1884, an armed mob 50 strong rode from Bisbee to Tombstone. After securing a length of rope from a store, grimly co-owned by Joe Goldwater of the ravaged mercantile, the angry vigilantes completed their grisly errand. As Tombstone awoke, John Heath's lifeless body dangled from a telephone pole, swaying in the morning breeze. The coroner's inquest would inscrutably conclude that the deceased died of emphysema of the lungs which might have been caused by strangulation, self-inflicted or otherwise. Thus, through swift judicial process and brute street justice, the six men behind the bungled Bisbee payroll heist paid for their crimes, their misdeeds remembered to this day by two weather-beaten grave markings, one for the five hanged by law, the other for the one lynched by the mob, standing sentinel in Tombstone's Boot Hill Cemetery. And so concludes our retelling of the dark chapter of Arizona's territorial days known as the Bisbee Massacre. Four townspeople killed in a robbery gone wrong, five criminals hanged, and one alleged accomplice lynched, 
a total of 10 lives lost in a few bloody days in 1883. A reminder of the high cost of crime and the brutal code of frontier justice in the wild west of old. Thank you for joining me on this desert romp. For joining me for these desert tales. If you enjoyed these stories, leave a like or comment. For further desert romps, hit the subscribe button. Happy trails!